to look at your age gap, I'm thinking she's not even 30 and he's close to retirement. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it, to visualize that age is is actually more than just a number. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 193 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. What kind of voice is that? I don't know, but I want to talk like the guy on the hidden brain. Um, Shocker? I don't know. <laughs> you can't, okay, maybe if you go live in India for 20 years, you can talk that way. <laughs> He's in India? I don't know where he is. He's of that descent. Okay, well. Something like that. I like the way he talks. Somewhere around in there. Who Welcome knows? to the hidden brain. Okay, <laughs> it's in the hidden brain. This is the no brain. Welcome this to the, the no brain <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and that's our next one, folks. <laughs> Those of you who have no brain will learn nothing. <laughs> okay, so last time we talked, David had COVID. Yep, and I sounded like Barry White. He stayed upstairs for five short days. I don't think it was longer than five. Maybe six. Well, the funny thing is, is at first I thought he needed to test negative to be able to come downstairs. But then I looked it up and it said you can test positive for like 90 days. And I was like, should I tell him? I was hoping you wouldn't. Go back upstairs. Because I looked it up before you said something about it. And I was like, I ain't telling her nothing. I'm staying up here. Go ahead. (laughs) Make my day. (laughs) <laughs> it was so nice and quiet. I could snore and nobody would wake me up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, those are the good old days. Yeah. Maybe you'll get sick again. I am sick. Sick of nothing. <laughs> Go ahead, punk. <laughs> Make your day. Make my day. Now, I have to admit, though, you were good to me while I was sick. You brought me stuff and called me all the time. Do you need anything? You were so sweet. Oh, good for me. But I know Valentine's Day's coming. That's why. Oh, I already got me something. Don't worry. <sighs> what? I kid. I kid. Celebrating no stupid Hallmark holiday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would say I would open up the mail when it comes to see what you ordered, but, you know, that's every day. You know, I'm about sick and tired. <laughs> yeah. I'm sick and tired. Are you sick and tired? Of you and Jackson making comments. About the Amazon deliveries. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that. Because, for instance, Jackson tells me the other day, I need you to order this part for my truck. Mm-hmm. And then it's, I need you to order this. And some stuff's for you too, David. Like what? Hang on, let me go through the list. <laughs> That's what I thought. You can't think of anything. <laughs> I ain't done yet. Hang on. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's go through this. <laughs> I ordered Jackson a floor mat or a mat to put in his room to put his boots on. I ordered toothpaste. I ordered a pooper scooper. (laughs) I ordered a toy for my great niece's birthday. I ordered a jail seat cushion for Jackson's hiney. (laughs) I ordered COVID test because you were sick. I ordered turmeric, curcumin, whatever that is, for me because it helps my bones not hurt so bad. And I ordered face wash, a harness blower motor cable, <laughs> a HDMI cable. All right. And we still haven't got to a single thing. Laundry detergent. Not a single thing for David. You use laundry detergent and you brush your teeth? I don't use that toothpaste. You know it. That was for you. You made me go to Dollar General. Oh, to oh here we go. Here we go. Oh, you had to find one. There we go. How far did you have to go? <laughs> Less than a month. All right. So a computer my, monitor. No. Uh-huh. Not for me. That was a gift for my mother. You ordered it. That was a Christmas gift for my mother. It came to this house. It was not for me. So you fail. Oh, whatever. <laughs> All right. So what else do you want to try to make a point of that you can't make a point of? Oh, a bore sight laser. That was my Christmas present. A precision screwdriver set. That was my Christmas present. Uh huh. You can't go back into Christmas stuff and go, oh, see, <laughs> see, you got stuff ordered. <laughs> a Wi Fi adapter. 
That was for a computer we sold. Pocket hole jig. That was for my dad for Christmas. I don't Christmas. care. It came to this house. Poker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So there you go. That's what we bought this year and part of last on Amazon. Yep. But none of it was like anything for me as far as oh. just fun. Oh. It was either work related or household related. Sure. Okay, I'm tired. Now that's of that's just Amazon, folks. That's not including all the other places that show up on our doorstep. Walmart, you may get through the Walmart list. Let's see. We have. Uh, let's see. What's the ones I've seen lately? I've seen Gap. I've seen. You have not seen Gap lately. <laughs> I've seen. What's the other place you get clothes from all the time? Coles. Col. Yeah, Coles. I've seen Coles. Belt. Belt. See. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I had to order a suit for us to go to some kind of thing that you had us going to, to where we had to dress up, quote, quote. Oh, so that was my fault you had to order that. Yep, see? <laughs> Telling you. Okay. I've thought about this. Have you? I have. I'm going to quit ordering anything. I'm not going to order food, butt paper, <laughs> <laughs> butt wipes, toothpaste, none of that. Y'all are on your own. No deodorant, nothing. Be a big boy. Get it yourself. You can't. You can't not order something. Yes, I can. It's like you know how people watch like me. The, watch me. Watch me. You know how people like the little thumbs up, like stuff. You know they get that that dopamine hit for yours. It's like the cart checkout. <laughs> you get a dopamine hit. Remember that when your butt's stinky <laughs> and dirty. Right. I won't smell it. You will. You have to use Jackson's bidet. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a cold but day before I use that. <laughs> okay. That's enough chit chat. Yep, because there's a lot of men who are going, I understand him completely. No. <laughs> I do want to read something very quickly, a review that we got from a member of the Nacho Kids Academy. And it says, Thank you so much. You all made me feel supported, educated me, and gave me amazing ideas. I am a better stepmom because of you all. The permission to nacho and seeing the blend through a non-nuclear family lens was key to both my husband and I. Thank you again for all the amazing work you all do for all the blended families. You have changed people's lives for the better. I love those testimonials. I do too. But you know what, lady? Whoever you are, you the one did the work. Pat yourself on the back. And that's what I told her. I replied and said, thank you so much. I'm glad it benefited you. But you are a better stepmom because you did the work. That's right. Give yourself a high five, girl. Mm-hmm. That's right. I've realized it's hard for me to read something that's not Southern. <laughs> oh, this is not Southern? Because she says, you all made me feel supported. And then so, you all. Well, well, she can't help. She can't write properly. She was writing fine. It's no, just I can't. I want to say y'all. That's the proper way to write it. She's trying to be improper. And separate David. Two, two words that were obviously made to be crammed together and say, y'all. This lady just says something <laughs> nice about us, and then there you go ragging on her. I'm not ragging on her because I don't know who it is. She's anonymous. <laughs> you anonymous, I'm awesome, was. Okay. Okay, y'all. <laughs> yeah, y'all. y'all. <laughs> okay, y'all. So if you join the Nacho Kids Academy because you want to better your and you're tired of waking up every morning and hating your life, join the Nacho Kids Academy. Go through the courses, watch the ones you find relevant to your blend, and start the Nacho Kids Boot Camp Challenge today. That's right. And in 30 days, you will notice positive changes. Mm-hmm. You'll be sending us a testimonial. You will. And make sure you say y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our guest today, y'all. <laughs> His stepmom, Mel. Mel is child-free. That means she ain't got no youngest because she don't want them. She's been blending for three to four years. Three stepkids. The hardest part of blending for her has been setting boundaries and transition days. Mm. Yeah, I remember those transition days. Ooh, oh. You start dreading them like two days beforehand. You're like, uh. <laughs> well, you are saying that as a bio parent. Mm-hmm. And her husband's happy when his kids come. Now, when we were going through a lot, I just it was stressful for me just having them come over, even though they were my kids, because right. I knew that this the total stress in the house was going to go through the roof. Mm-hmm. And she mentioned setting boundaries, and we talk a little bit about this 
And she said it was probably the first time that she had to set boundaries. Hmm. Setting boundaries is not easy. It can be very uncomfortable, but there are healthy boundaries that you need to set. Best advice, without boundaries, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. I say, without change, nothing will change. (laughs) Nothing changes, nothing will change. That's very true. If you don't want it to change, it ain't going to (laughs) change. Okay. I don't know if you're a Confucius or Confucian. (laughs) Something unique about her blend, there is a 23-year age gap between her and her partner. Uh Uh-uh. Yes, sir. So she is technically closer in age to the kids than her partner. She'd be closer in age to the grandkids than her partner. David. (laughs) Sorry, Mel. (laughs) <laughs> I can't control him. I have to nacho him. Oh, uh, no boundaries. I'm sorry. Nacho him too, Mel, if it's bothering you. <laughs> I know. Wow, that's got to be tough when you're like breaking out your music to listen to. And, you know, I'm listening to the Eagles and you're listening to, I don't even know somebody <laughs> this relevant today. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> we'd have to look it up, which is sad. <laughs> and then we'd probably pick some like really bad person. <laughs> Well, that's one thing that we talk about is she said people will say age is just a number. It's not just a number. There are differences because of the age, whether it's music. Yeah, life experiences. Life experiences. Yeah. And the fact that he knows what a fax machine is. <laughs> she does too, I asked. <laughs> he he remembers life before the internet. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I think I brought that up. <laughs> but I was like, man, it would be fascinating to just sit there and talk to him, though. be like talking to your grandma about when ice was <laughs> five Did you cent. just call him your grandma? No, but you know what I'm saying. So so she's our age? No, she's a lot younger than us. So we're closer to his age. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be fascinating talking to somebody in our age bracket is what you're saying. Yeah, it's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, if you want something fascinating, call Lori. She's got a bunch of dinosaur stories to tell you. No, it's kind of like when we tell the kids, yeah, back in the day we had a cassette player and you had to fast forward or when you would try to record off the radio, you know, just good old stories like that. Yeah, I had one of my kids one day, they said, man, if we ever have a time machine, I want to go back to the 80s because they sound amazing. And I said, Whatever you've heard about it, it's true. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but the 80s were pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think my 90s were pretty cool, too. You remember them? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think they were. <laughs> she did say that regarding the age gap that she has found out there is a game that people play called Dad or Daddy. Okay. So say you and I are sitting at a restaurant and we're looking at people and we're going, Uh, that's her boyfriend, or that's her husband, or that's her daddy. Dad or daddy. Yep. Well, I I Google it, I don't get nothing. Hmm. She's in Canada. Wonder if that's why. Maybe it's dad or sugar daddy. No. (laughs) Yeah, I have to look that one up. Maybe it's like we used to say, who's your daddy? Well, that did come up when I Googled that. I'd be scared of Google games. (laughs) Anyway, that's what she said. So we're going with it. Google just don't know about it yet. All right, David, you ready to get to listening? Let's do it. Today, we have Stepmom Mel. Hey, Mel, how are you? Hi, Lori. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. So tell us a little bit about you and your blend. And my blend. That's so funny because five years ago, I wouldn't have known what that meant. But (laughs) (laughs) I met my partner actually overseas and we did a long distance relationship and he has three kids from a former um, marriage and so for a long time, I put off meeting the kids because I, I really enjoyed our relationship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and when we stopped doing long distance and and moved to the same city, you know, I, I did eventually have to meet the three children. So the blend probably started, I would say, three, four years ago okay. um, when we officially moved in together. And I have a tween stepdaughter and then two teen stepsons. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So who relocated to where? I relocated from Turkey to Canada. Wow. Yeah. So it was a pretty big move. I had lived in Canada 
before I went to school here. And so I was familiar with the area. It wasn't completely new, but the city itself was not a city that I had lived in. So I was kind of entering someone else's life, I would say. Mm -hmm. How did you and your husband meet? We met uh, through work, actually. I was um, hired by his company to do a project just as a consultant. And we were flying around and got to know each other. And then once the project ended, we just decided to stay in touch. And then that led to, okay, maybe we can do a trip together. And, you know, that led to more trips and then talking every day and, and then a relationship formed. And then I love you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then it was like, oh, but there are some obstacles. So how long did y'all do the long distance relationship? We did long distance for a year and we actually put a plan together. So we said, this is a bit ridiculous if we don't have a plan. So we're going to give it a year at the end of the year if we don't go to the next step, which is to, to relocate and live together and give that a go then we will just end the relationship because neither of us really wanted to continue this like unforeseeable future. Yeah. That's great that you had a plan. So many people don't have plans and I'm a planner. Yeah. I, well, I, I'm an event planner by (laughs) my career. So I am very much so a planner and my partner, we have a 23 year age gap. So he, while he's not a planner, he also just didn't really want to waste any time. Wow. 23 years. Yeah. So then we threw that into the mix of the long distance and three kids. And there's a lot of a lot of things against us, I would say. On paper, we are not, not a great match. Really? Mm-hmm. But it it works, right? And right. I think that when people say age is just a number, I kind of hate that because it isn't just a number. Like there are there are challenges yes. with an age gap um, as big as ours, but it just means you have to put a little bit more work into it, right? You're in different mm-hmm. stages of your life, so exactly. you have to you have to be very mindful of that. I was 27, 28 when I entered this relationship. I was not equipped to be a stepmother of three. I was still figuring myself out. I was still trying to solidify my career. So we were very, very, we were on different paths, but I'm really glad that we stuck it through to make it work. But to say, to say it's not work is, is just inaccurate in my opinion. Honey, any (laughs) relationship is work. You know that whether it's a roommate or your kid or stepkid or parents. I mean, it's all work. Mm -hmm. When you met him, you were 28. He was 51. Yeah. Yeah. When you say that people say age is just a number, you're right. I've seen so many relationships where there is a big age gap. And to look at your age gap, I'm thinking she's not even 30 and he's close to retirement. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it. To visualize that age is is actually more than just a number, <laughs> right? And so you're still, let's see, y'all been blending about four years. So you're in your early thirties. Yes. So you probably don't even know what a fax machine is. <laughs> oh, I do actually know what a fax machine is, but you know, I was at the tail end of that. <laughs> well, it's funny though because I'm sitting here thinking. Okay, you might not have things, quote, quote, in common as far as music that you listened to growing up or Mm -hmm. how you were raised or even cell phones, the internet, all that stuff. But he can tell you good stories about the good old days. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, it it is. It's it's definitely interesting when there are kind of cultural references that I don't get, but... Mm -hmm. I also grew up in the Middle East as an expatriate. So I did have a different upbringing overall because I didn't grow up in the West. I did go to an American school, which is why I have no accent. But Uh we did have just very, very different upbringings in terms of like time and um, environment. Right. Not just the age, but the culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's just flabbergasted me. Anyway. (laughs) I have to say this and forgive me, but do people ever say he's old enough to be your daddy? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually found out that there was a game for that. It's called like when you see couples and you're kind of unsure, is it your partner or is it a family member? And it's called (laughs) dad or daddy. (laughs) Dad or daddy? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, So I don't know how many people look at us and say like, oh, dad or daddy. But when you see us together, The people who may have questioned it, I think when they spend a little bit of time with us, they say, oh, I get it, right? You guys are just on the same wavelength and it doesn't feel weird when I'm with you. But sure, there there are definitely people that that see it on paper or hear about it and they're like, oh, I wouldn't do that. That's the thing is you, it's not like you woke up one day and said, I'm going to fall in love with a man that's 23 years older than me. No, no. And, you know, my parents had an 18 year age gap, so I'm sure. Oh, wow therapist could have a field day with this, but yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I grew up with a big age gap in my life my for my whole life, right? So it wasn't as weird to me, but uh, you know, between my parents and I, I definitely won. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask you what your parents thought of it, but they probably didn't think a whole lot about it because of their age gap. Yeah, they were, they were concerned in the beginning, mostly actually because of the kids. They were worried that I was jumping into something that was a bit beyond my years. And I think that's a legit worry. Yes. Um, Especially I'm the only child, right? So Mm -hmm. they wanted me to have, you know, figure out my life on my own and not be thrown into to somebody else's life and thrown into like a very quote unquote adult situation that I quite frankly was not ready for at 28. Right. But once they they met my partner, again, it was the, ah, I get it. Yeah. You know, I feel safe knowing that my daughter is in this situation. And I don't think, I don't think there's a red flag here. Good. Did you meet the stepkids before you moved in together? So when I moved to Canada, one of this was a very elaborate plan. Like there was a spreadsheet with (laughs) timelines and budgets and, you know, like it was, it was pretty hardcore in terms of what what we had mapped out. Right. Because it is, it's risky Mm -hmm. um, when there are kids involved. And when I moved out here, I actually had my own place. So I, I rented a room and a house with some other women just to make sure that I had a space to go to that I wasn't just jumping into this life, not knowing what I was in for. And we put off, uh, it was more, I put off meeting the kids for maybe a month and a half. Once I had moved here, Mm -hmm. I really, really didn't want to meet them. And you didn't No, you know, I Ah. never wanted children to begin with. Okay. Very, very early on. I had made that decision as a, as a, maybe when I was 11 years old or 10 years old, I just knew. And so see, that amazes me. Yeah. I think, I think some people, you know, you, you just know, and, and that feeling actually gets stronger as, as you age, because you're more aware of what adding kids into the equation means. I just had that epitome kind of early on. Yeah. And so I didn't want to meet them. And my partner was pushing it a bit. He said, you know, eventually you have to, right? Not realizing that what was going on in my head was if I meet your kids, most likely our relationship's going to end because I'm going to be confronted with the fact that I don't want this in my life, especially at this age. So we, again, put together another plan (laughs) of how we would meet them. You know, he had done some counseling around it. We're big advocates of counseling individual and couples. Yes. And um and the counselor had suggested not meeting the kids in their home so they wouldn't feel trapped initially mm-hmm. or at a restaurant again just fe- that that idea of feeling trapped. We wanted to pick a spot where the kids didn't feel like they were stuck with me in that mm-hmm. initial meeting. So we had planned out, you know, meeting you know, coming to this very cool place called Granville Island in Vancouver. We, I took a cab, he drove with the kids. It's this like open air market with shops and restaurants and artisan boutiques. And it's just a very cool place where you can walk around. There's tons to do. It was a beautiful day. And so when we first met, it was outside 
And then the kids kind of were free to walk around and then we would meet in an hour for lunch. So yes, they could walk with us, but they didn't have to. Oh. And then we sat on a patio for lunch. And again, that was open air. And that's where we kind of first initially bonded was at that restaurant on the patio. But giving them that freedom to roam around and kind of figure out like, oh, like, yes, this is probably uncomfortable for every single person here, but I, I'm not stuck with her or I'm not mm-hmm. stuck with her and dad. And and so it, it was a really good kind of initial meeting. And, and I was like, okay, like, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. But we didn't move in officially until a year after, or maybe eight months after that. I, I held on to my, the room I was renting. I just really spent no time there. By the time we officially told the kids I was moving in. They're like, but she lives here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but so it, it was, was so good. smart for you to keep that place. Yeah. And yeah. I think that what my partner didn't want was me coming here and feeling like even if I didn't want this life, I had no choice because that's where I lived. That's who I came here for. So I actually, when I moved out here, I had started my career abroad But I went back to school for six months in Canada. I didn't need to, but it was the only way for me to get my visa on my own. Okay. Was to just enroll in a six month, eight month program. And then I can apply for to immigrate on my own rather than me coming here. My only option being marriage, right? Right. Great. Uh, we just didn't want that. So we did everything as independently as possible. And I think that was the best decision that we made. I completely agree. Mm-hmm. Plus, I love the spreadsheets. I do. I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm Maybe like, that's, that's awesome. what I should do. Blended family spreadsheets. Yeah, Some like project family. management. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is. I mean, a blended family, there's a ton of project management. I always say if you are, if you're a stepmom or a stepdad, that should be enough on your resume to say that you are an excellent project manager. You can handle conflict, you can handle deadlines, you can handle change, you know, in a moment's notice, you know how to plan ahead of time. Yeah. That's a good point. It's a skill. Yes. And plus it shows that you can deal with adversity, crazy high conflict, bio parents. <laughs> Just, oh yeah. There's so oh, yeah. much All of it. it. <laughs> yeah. So when you met the kids, well, first of all, I have to say, when you were talking about y'all being in this open air market type thing and the kids were kind of, you can go on your own and we'll just meet for lunch. I'm thinking I would have stalked y'all. I would have got behind y'all and watched to see how y'all were interacting. That's what I would have done if it was my dad. Mm, Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I should, I should ask what was going through their head at the time now, now that we're, you know, blended. I know they hated my hat and they hated my pink pants, <laughs> which we we <laughs> laugh about now because I was like, oh, this is a great outfit. Spent so much time trying to figure out what would be, you know, approachable and <laughs> non-offensive and it turned out to be an outfit that they were not super fond of. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> so you meet them and you said you bonded. So you got along well. Yes. Initially, I bonded with the youngest almost instantaneously. And I thought that we actually, my partner and I thought that that would be the most challenging relationship to build because she was so young. She was seven at the time and a girl. So I didn't know how she would accept if she would accept another, you know, woman in her father's life. And that bond was just immediate, almost immediate. It was insane. And I don't know if it wasn't for that quick bond, I think I probably would have ran Mm -hmm. because the other two kids took a long time to, to get to a place where it was even, it felt comfortable in the home Mm -hmm. for any of us, right? Like they were so uncomfortable with me, rightfully so they were older. They understood, you know, what was going on with their parents a bit more than the youngest did. In this case, you know, I think ignorance really is bliss, right? Mm -hmm. The youngest had no idea what was really going on. I don't think she fully understood. And, uh, but the older two, it took a while for them to warm up and, and it came in stages. Like the oldest took the longest 
which I thought that would have actually been the easiest relationship because I'm like, well, we're closer in age than you and your parents, right? <laughs> maybe, right. <laughs> maybe this this will be an immediate bond, but it wasn't. And and that's just his personality type as well, right? He's right. a bit more reserved just in general, not just with me. So yeah, it was it was a it was all all three were different. And that's normal. Mm-hmm. So how long had their parents been split up when you met them? So it wasn't long. It was about a year. So okay. it was pretty fresh, I would say. Yeah, Especially that, that is kind of quick. Kids mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, in a kid's mind, it's quick. Yeah. So how often did he have the stepkids? Since the beginning has been 50-50. So one week on, one week off. Okay. And how far or how close does Baya Mom live? We live like a 10, 15 minute drive from one another. So it's actually, in my opinion, a perfect amount. You know, yes. it's, it's quick enough for if something's forgotten, it's not going to completely derail your day to have to go pick something up, right? That a kid mm-hmm. forgot. Or, you know, as they get older, it's not challenging for them to take transit and go bus on their own to pick up their own belongings. Right. Right. But it's just enough distance that there's no, there's no spontaneous pop-ins. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I think personally, 10, 15 minute drive is a sweet spot. Yes. How about the bio mom? Have you had any interaction with her? How did she feel about you and their dad getting together or are y'all just pretty much she does her thing, you do yours, don't really have anything to do together? Yeah, I don't, I mean, we have the big age difference. So I think in general, it is challenging for most women to accept, you know, that kind of cliche of Mm -hmm. the younger woman or the woman that's half your age. Yes. (laughs) Um, It's like, it's very, and you know, he was also 50, right? So it's like the classic midlife crisis you know, you could spin it however you want. The mail order bride, the midlife crisis, the, you know. <laughs> I'll love it, girl. I'll love it. There's so many ways to spin it. Like, I I get it. I was probably, I was I was a very easy target if mm-hmm. you wanted to, to vent your frustrations about what was going on. So I, it wasn't easy. And I, I don't think, I don't think anyone would have handled it very well. For us, I think the best way to kind of navigate our dynamic is to really just do our own thing. Like we don't need to communicate unless we absolutely need to, right? right. Like unless there's there's a reason to communicate, we don't need to be in each other's lives texting or emailing or calling or visiting, right? Right. And so we've done a good job now after setting many many boundaries that Yeah, we're just not involved in each other's lives unless it's absolutely necessary for the kids. And you don't need to. Yes. And that took a while, though, for me to to really understand. So Um, did you come in saying, I want to be in the group chat with you and your ex, and I want to know what's going on minute by minute between y'all, if you've talked to her, what y'all talked about? No, it was more of, I think in the beginning, because the dynamic was a bit (laughs) rock. Yeah, I'm being very diplomatic here. The dynamic was rocky in mm-hmm. the beginning. So any type of frustrations that were going on between the ex-spouses would bleed into our home life, right? Right. Um, because you have you're after a divorce, you're dealing with financial stress, right? There's a lot of back and forth around finances, getting, you know, really separating the things, really separating the schedules, right? You you have a couple that's been operating together for 15 years or 10 years or however many years they were married. And all of a sudden they need to operate individually. And sometimes one of the partners, for instance, will not quite get on board with that separation as quickly. Mm -hmm. And so it does create, it create, it bleeds into your own family dynamic. So I started being more vocal about my boundaries, like maybe only a year, year and a half ago. So there were stressors that would just impact us because I wasn't sure how to set my own boundaries around it and say, Hey, actually, you know, we can do all these things on our own as a family. You know, we don't need assistance. Right. Right. 
So I have to ask, were you the reason that Bio Mom and Bio Dad split up? Oh, no. I I didn't even meet him when they split up. Okay. Yeah. I had so to ask because you said they'd been split up about a year and I'm thinking, hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and I think that that's a fair question to ask. I had met him maybe three, four months after they had officially split because he had not actually gone to the other country yet to take on that role. So it was still very fresh when we did meet a couple, like three, four months is still quite fresh. I actually thought he was still married. Like I, I just assumed cause he had kids, but. Right. Yeah. How did he react when you started creating these boundaries? Was he on board with it? Did he push back any? Was he afraid his kids wouldn't come once you put up these boundaries? You know, because guilty parent syndrome is real. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I I never thought about guilty parent syndrome. I'm trying to think initially the boundaries. They took some time because the first boundaries were more around um, schedule changes. Mm-hmm. I was noticing that our one week off was tending to not feel like one week off because we were taking on kid tasks and kid time on Mm -hmm. our weeks where we were supposed to just be the two of us. Right. And so that was kind of the first boundary I'd set. Like we can't just on a whim, if someone wants to go to a party, we don't get to just take the kids four days early and then have only two days to ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Because the other person wants to go to a party. If you want to go to a party, try to figure out what you're going to do with your kids on your week before coming to us, right? Like, it's not an urgent matter. And I, I really, really value my time, my off weeks, because I'm not a bio parent, right? Like, it, right. I need that recharge. <laughs> and so that was the first one of kind of like... Look, I'm I'm not saying anything negative about the kids here, but I also have to be very mindful that I I like these weeks, right? I like these breaks. And if it's not urgent, it's not my problem. Right. right. And so that was like kind of the initial step. And then after that, it was more around communication boundaries and um, physical boundaries around my home. That was the biggest one was I was like, we need to keep our home separate. There's no revolving door that says just because you are a parent to the children that are my step parent or step kids, you you don't have access into my home whenever you want when I'm not there. Right. Yeah. So the boundaries he was in the beginning, I think it took time to enforce on his end because it's you're really fundamentally changing how someone operates, right? Mm-hmm. And he didn't probably mind if the kids came when he was at home. Yeah. And and the kids is, wasn't the big deal. It was the, the bio parent. Oh, she was coming to your house? Yeah. <gasps> so that one yeah. was, that was the big no-no for yes. me. And that still to this day is the the biggest, that's the line that when you cross it, there is, it, it's like a physical reaction for me because my space has always been my sanctuary. I take a lot of time, you know, creating a clean, safe, you know, welcoming environment. And to feel that that safety is violated, it really, really like changes how I how I feel. Right. And yeah. So that was that was the big one. Yeah. But it takes time, right? It takes time to realize that that's even a boundary you can set, at least for me. Because again, as a step parent with no kids, I felt very much the guest in somebody else's family, right? Right. So it's their family and their rules, and I'm coming into it. That was the mentality I had, which was a very, very unhealthy way to live. And then as I kind of did more counseling and, and really understood like what my personal boundaries were, and then realizing that the the only way to kind of move forward is to communicate those personal boundaries. And that's going to get really uncomfortable, right? It's going to rock the boat for a bit. And right. Telling someone, hey, don't come into my house when they don't understand why it could be a problem. Mm-hmm. It's a very uncomfortable conversation to have. 
Yeah. Did you move into the home that she used to live in? Oh God, no. But that was offered when she had bought a house, she had offered us to take over their family home. And I said, no, because you I are think, a smart lady. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, I was fortunate that I didn't have to, right? Like we, we had a choice in that matter. I know that some people, when they're blending, there's no, you know, that's just the home the kids grew up in. One person moved out. And so you move into that family home. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that. Like I didn't want in the early days of blending that the kids are seeing me do things that their mother used to do and and live the the life that they're used to seeing mom and dad live right, right. It, to me it's it would have just delayed the process or it would have just created an a cloud of bitterness over um my role in the family right because right. it would look like i am literally replacing somebody yeah mhm yeah well I have to say, though, it would have made more sense to me that she would come to your house if it was her old house. But it not being her old house makes me like that's really you shouldn't have even had to set that boundary. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a home she had never been in. So she actually the first time she had gone in, she had never stepped foot inside the house. So there was how do you go into somebody's home looking for something when you've never been in the house? Yeah. Know where to look because you don't know the house and you don't know the house because you've never been invited in and you've never been invited in for various reasons, right? Right. Because you're not wanted in here. (laughs) Yeah. If the relationship was different, like I know people who, who operate very differently, almost like they're in a sitcom, right? Where Mm -hmm. they're, you would never know that they were even divorced and everyone's happy and there's, two families and two separate sets of kids and everyone's in each other's business and freely moving around the homes and in each other's lives and having yeah. dinner. That's fine for the, for the families that can, that have chosen to do that. Right. And are mm-hmm. able to maintain it. We haven't made that, you know, we chose to not do that because that's just not where our dynamic is at. That right. would create so many more problems if we, tried to introduce that type of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) No, I moved into the house that he shared with the ex. Mm -hmm. And you were so right. It makes it harder. And really, it would have been ideal if we could have moved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But David lives on family land. So it's not as simple as, oh, let's sell your house and everybody get a new house. And I didn't even like her coming up in the driveway. Yeah. It just felt weird. Yeah. And so that's so refreshing to hear because I I didn't know any step and I still don't really know a lot of stepmoms. So all of those feelings, and I don't know if that's how you felt, but I felt like there was something wrong with me. Like, why can't I ex- you know, accept e- even the home thing? I was like, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe this is like just the way that it is her kid's house half the time. So maybe it's also kind of her house. You know, like you go through that mm-hmm. mental kind of gymnastics of like, oh, but maybe it's, maybe I'm the problem here. Right. And that's right. just, like you're gaslighting yourself. <laughs> yes. Like, oh, this is just, you're not comfortable with it. Just accept you're not comfortable with it. If you don't, like, if you're not comfortable with this person in your driveway, there's a reason. Right? Mm-hmm. It it means that the the dynamic, there's something there that's not, you know, just kumbaya. Right. So the stepkids come every other week. Mm -hmm. And I know transition days are hard for most people. Mm -hmm. Were they hard for them and hard for you? They're even hard for the bio parents sometimes. Yeah, I wish my partner could. (laughs) I don't think it's hard for my partner at all. He's, He's very much in the boat of like, I love it when the kids come. I've missed them after a week. I'm super happy to let them go after a week because I'm exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's he's always had that mindset. For me, again, as someone who does not have children, who's significantly younger, who thinks of their home as their sanctuary and like this like peaceful pond that she's created, (laughs) um, you know, it's, it's, it is so difficult. Transition day for me to this day. And I don't know if it gets easier. And maybe it does because 
fortunately I have older stepkids. So, mm-hmm. you know, one's out of the house this summer. Right. And then the other follows like two yeah. years later. So I'm at kind of the tail end of, of things being actually knock on wood. I don't want to say that it, it might get easier. Who knows? But for me, transition days, the reason that I find them challenging is because my home goes from my partner and I, two people, two adults, right? To five people, mm-hmm. <laughs> more children than adults. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It means more stuff, more clutter, more mess, more food. Myself, yes, uh, you know, like make your bed, clean your dishes. Like I actually truly don't enjoy doing this. I don't know why anybody would subscribe to this. I'm looking for an app that just does that for me. Like, I don't know why we don't have this where it just keeps reminding all of them what to do. Yeah. Hey, that's a good idea. Be reminded, right? Like, I just don't really want to, I don't, I don't find it fun to switch between being a event planner who is with her partner and spends her free time after work, relaxing, cooking, baking, going out, meeting friends, exercising, you know, doing whatever I want in that time after work to not doing whatever, you know, not feeling Mm -hmm. like I have that same level of relaxation or freedom. So transition days, something I really to this day struggle with. And I keep, I would say uh, most of my counseling is really around to some level, dealing with transition days. So I don't know if it gets easier. (laughs) It does get easier. But part of that is not letting your mind go there a couple of days before. So say, for instance, they come on Mondays. Mm -hmm. On Saturday before they come, if you're dreading it already, you are losing time that you're not having to deal with them because you're focused on having to deal with them. Oh, that's such good insight. And then if, you know, if you build yourself up of, oh God, they're coming, it just stresses you out. Mm -hmm. Now I did get to a point and it took a while where I looked forward to my stepkids coming. I never, yes, I never thought I would have said that, but I did because we built our own little relationships. For instance, one of them we like watching Shark Tank together. <laughs> so I would record it when he wasn't here and we would watch it when he would come. It was one of those where I just look forward to spending that time with him. And you talk about having your little peaceful life. You know, it was just my son and I, and we moved in with David and his four kids. Four kids. Wow. And when we got married, they were, I always screw this up. Let's see. We got married in 09. So the triplets were nine and Avery had just turned 11 and all boys. (laughs) So I went from a tranquil home with me and my sweet baby boy (laughs) to a flipping zoo. Oh gosh. And I'm not kidding. It was like a zoo because David liked them running around and chasing each other and jumping on furniture. They're boys. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you jump on my couch and we're going to have it out. (laughs) Don't jump on the couch. You sit on a couch. You don't lay on a couch. You sit on a couch and you don't sit on the edge. You sit, you know, I'm really funny about furniture because my mom was. So those were big adjustments for me. And even the clutter, like you said, when they come in and drop their shoes and their book bags and their jackets. Oh, my gosh, it looked like a department store. Oh my gosh, this is so refreshing to hear because that spikes my anxiety. When I come home on that transition day, if I'm not already there Mm -hmm. and it's just chaos in front of the door and I'm like, oh yeah, I already knew it was transition day, but I didn't need my home to like scream it at me as I walked in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, this is so refreshing to hear (laughs) that I'm not alone. (laughs) Yes. And it'll get easier too. And I know this may sound extreme, but when you see the kids' shoes on the floor, whatever it is, when you come in on transition day and it looks like something blew up in your house, Mm -hmm. take a deep breath. If you need to, go ahead and just walk past it, go to the bathroom, change your clothes, whatever, and come back. You know it's there, right? So the second time you see it, it won't be as jolting, (laughs) we'll say. Mm -hmm. 
But then remind yourself that, you know, yes, I wish these shoes and everything weren't in such disarray. I wish they would put them neatly here, whatever. But thank goodness these kids are healthy enough to throw their crap places. Because a lot of people have kids that are sick. Mm -hmm. And they would do anything in the world to see their kids' shoes at the front door. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a little bit of a gratitude check. It is. And maybe that's one thing that helped me through my journey was a friend of mine had a daughter that had San Filippo, which is um, basically Alzheimer's in kids. Mm. So I was watching her journey you know, on her Facebook post and she would have done anything for her kid to be able to run in the yard and track mud in. Whereas a lot of us are like, oh my God, you track mud in and we're mad about it for three hours. Whereas she would have given anything to have that happen. So a lot yeah. of times it's putting things in perspective and I know it's not easy to do. And sometimes people will say, really, you got to be that dramatic about it. Well, yeah, sometimes you do. If it's really upsetting you, then you have to step back and say, wait a minute, let me look at this differently. Let me look at this as, yes, transition days are hard, but more than likely two years from now, we're only going to have the youngest here. We're not going to have all this chaos. And those shoes everywhere represents my husband or my boyfriend being happy because his kids are here and he's happy. Oof, that's good. Yeah, I like that. That's a good way to reframe it because I actually have not been able to reframe it in a way that I was, that I could approach it differently. And I think that that's a really good way. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but like I had OCD. So, and when I say had it, I had, I had to let it go because David didn't care if the shoes were at the door. The kids didn't care. My son didn't care. I was the only one that cared. So my options were to tell the kids to pick up their shoes and them ignore me and make me mad or <laughs> me do it myself, which is something I did for a while until I got tired of doing it. And sometimes you ha just have to weigh which is going to stress me out more, seeing the shoes or picking them up myself. Yeah, I do that in my head quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I flip flop between the two. I'm like, do I want the space to just be clean? Do I want to have to dictate it and resent somebody for it? Do I let it go and still hold on to some resentment? I, it, you know, none of these options like lead to not being resentful. So that's the part I need to work on. But yeah, it, it does take time. And I think also with the OCD factor, I think I also have a bit of OCD. My mom mm -hmm. certainly does. Um, she just stayed with us and she's like, I don't know how you do this. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> she's like, this is chaos. But I grew up in a very clean house because of that. And then I really valued that really clean well, house. Well, it was just you. It's just me. Yeah. I was yeah. the only child. So again, my house was spotless. <laughs> well, and that's one thing. Dishes drove me crazy. Oh, yes. And it's funny because when it was just Jackson and I in our house, I would do clothes at night and, you know, wash them in the morning. I'd put them in the dryer. And before I left for work, I would just lay them on the couch mm -hmm. so I could put them up when I got home. That did not bother me at all. Yeah. Dirty dishes in the sink drove me nuts. I could not stand dirty dishes in the sink. You move in a house where there's seven people total. Oh, gosh. There's always a dirty dish. Always, you can wash everything, put it up, go to the bathroom and come back. And I'll be darned if there's not a bowl or a cup in that sink. Yeah. And yeah. And that one, it just hurts so personally because you're like, oh, I put all this effort into mm -hmm. it. You see the clean sink. All it takes is for you to either put it in the dishwasher right next to the sink or to, God forbid, clean it yourself, right? That yes. one bowl. But Please well, add, add it to my plate. <laughs> yes, we tried to um, put it in the dishwasher, but then it never failed. They would put dirty dishes in with the clean dishes. Oh, gosh. So whether it was intentional or not, I don't think so. I think they're just oblivious to certain things. So I it was just, so yeah, it was just, Lori, yeah. you're the one that has the issue with this. You can't stand here and wash every cup after, <laughs> after they drop it off. Just let it go. It's okay. It is okay if that cup sits there. Yeah. That, that's where I want to be. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm working well, towards. You'll get there. You'll get there. But now let me ask you this. 
you, do you tell your stepkids to clean up? Yes. Um, I, my partner and I are not on the same level when it comes to cleaning or micromanaging it. So pretty early on, I realized if I don't step in, Mm -hmm. uh, I will leave because the way that they operated as a family in terms of like cleaning up and chores and stuff didn't, did not align with what I had in mind for my life. Mm -hmm. So I did start enforcing rules and I'm glad I did. I'm sure it made me less liked in the house, but now, you know, I have to give it to the kids. Like they wake up, they make their bed, you know, nine out of 10 times on their own without being told. They put stuff in their hamper without being told. They don't Mm -hmm. leave wet towels on the, you know, on the bathroom floor every time they use the bathroom. Those were things that were not implemented. Oh, of course not. Yeah. And so that I put up, post-its. I did daily reminders. I like, I stressed myself out to the point of like probably harboring a lot of resentment, Mm -hmm. but I can look back at it now and say, thank God I did because we would not, I don't think we would be a couple if, you know, five years later or whatever it is, we were still living the way that they were living. (laughs) It just, it wouldn't have worked. Well, were they receptive to you telling them those things? Or, I mean, did they just like immediately go, oh, okay, Mel told us to do this. Let's do this. There was some pushback. There was one instance where the oldest stepson, I think this was this was early on. This is like when I first was introduced to the kids, maybe like a couple months in or a month in or something. It was new. And, uh, you know, him and I had not bonded in any way, shape or form. And I was, he was still sleeping. I think everyone was still sleeping and I was unloading the dishwasher in the morning, early morning. I was up to unload the dishwasher Mm -hmm. or maybe it was late at night and everyone was, either way, people were sleeping and he came out and he was like, he said something so rude, yelled it out, like to just basically shut up. Right. Like we're sleeping. And I'm doing I, dishes, which I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Like whatever it was. And I remember just my heart stopped. Like, oh my God, I want, like, I want to scream. Right. Mm-hmm. And I stayed quiet and I just sat down again. Like I'm a 28 year old with like, no, I'm not equipped to be in this situation. And thankfully I didn't say anything and I waited and I waited. And the next day I said, Hey, can I talk to you? And it was so uncomfortable. This was before I had ever set a single boundary in my entire life. Like forget the kids. Like it was, I had never set any boundaries. I'd never spoken up. I had not done the work on myself that I needed to do to be in that kind of family dynamic, but I did sit him down and I was so uncomfortable. And I said, look, you know, I'm sorry that I made a lot of noise. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I really like next time I will be more mindful about people sleeping. I had no idea that the the sound was traveling that much, Mm -hmm. but I'd also really like to not be spoken to like that. And that moment really, I think changed our dynamic, right? Because before that, I think I let everyone walk all over me, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I was, again, the guest in this house. I was a guest in their life. I was the outsider. I didn't have a say. I didn't have a voice. And I think that that switched things a bit to be like, hey, like you can't actually disrespect me. It's not, that's not going to be tolerated. Right. But I didn't say it in a rude way, right? I was also very aware that like, yeah, I, I was probably making so much noise. I didn't think about it. Again, I'm not used to living with a bunch of people. I have been operating solo up until this very moment. <laughs> so, yes. So it was, it was a learning. It was like kind of a big learning moment. But now, you know, I have no problem being like, hey, go back downstairs. I'll text you a photo of all the dishes and be like, seriously, guys, like you realize I spent an hour cleaning. Like I have no problem with it. And they're very receptive to it. They understand that I like a clean home. They know their dad's probably not going to be hounding them to to clean up, but I will manage that. (laughs) Did your husband ever say you're being hard on them or was he open to you telling them to do these things? Because a lot of times when the step parent does come in and 
tell the stepkids to do things. The stepkids start start complaining. And then the bio parents like, you just need to lay off my kids. Mm -hmm. No, not in my partner, not for my partner. I think he was actually quite glad, to be honest. I would assume that he was quite happy that someone stepped in. I would like to think the bio mom, like is secretly also happy. Like, I'm sorry, but I, I would like to think that this behavior carries on in both houses, right? I'll mm-hmm. take full ownership of doing that because I know what it was like before me and I know what it's like after me. Yes. And only one thing has changed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would like to take credit for that. So I think, I don't think anyone was upset by it because I never did it in a, in a rude step monster way. Right. right. Like, Hey guys, you know, you forgot to make your bed or the way that I usually reframe it. Cause I find that this works really well with the kids is if it's their chore week and they haven't done their dishes, I'll do something. And it's like a lot of dishes, right? Mm-hmm. I'll be like, Hey, I'll take out the compost for you. Can you just please go do your dishes? Right. So I'll usually do it with like, Oh, I'm going to do this one teeny tiny thing for you, but go do the big thing you're supposed to do. Right. And that there, it, that's a, for for our family at least that seems to work really well it's like yes. hey like we're we're all contributing here right it's mm-hmm. not just me yelling at you to do something it's to me showing you that this is a team effort and i'm doing something for you you actually have to take out the compost as well right, right? but right. i'll take that off your plate if you just go ahead and and get started on everything you're supposed to be doing i know when i moved in of course i thought david's kids should have chores and responsibilities because i did growing up Mm-hmm. And you have to remember, my son's five years younger than the triplets. So we had a little chore chart that we started. And with so many kids, it was one person dusted, one person vacuumed. It wasn't a lot to do, like maybe 10 minutes. Dishes were the worst, you know, mm-hmm. of all of it. But when they didn't do it the way I thought they should, I would say something. Not to them, but to David. I would mm-hmm. say, did you see how he vacuumed? There's no way that's clean. And then David would get defensive because I was talking crap about his kid and how they vacuumed. And well, sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. I think in the beginning he didn't. But then after so long of me, nah, 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 nah. (laughs) He was like, just, oh my gosh. (laughs) But it just seemed like a lot of times with there being so many kids, I remember one time we were having them help clean out the building. It was more work trying to figure out who ran off. (laughs) You turn around and two of them are gone. (laughs) You're like, well, where are so-and-so and and -and so-and-so? They went inside. So you go get them and you're like, hey, you need to come back outside. Then you come back and the other three are gone. (laughs) I'm like, this is not working. But one of the things that I had to realize, and it, it took a while, David's mom stepped in when David and his ex split up. Mm -hmm. She did everything for these kids. Oh. Everything. When we first got married, she would come over here during the week. Talk about somebody coming to your house that you don't want, you know, while you're not there. And (laughs) clean up their room. Oh. She would clean up their rooms, wash their sheets. Like we were incapable of doing that or... She didn't want them to have to do it. Interesting. And one thing I will stress to people that are getting ready to blend, if you have changes that you plan on making once you do blend, bust out that Excel spreadsheet (laughs) and say, boundaries need to be set with my mom. The kids need to start cleaning up before Lori moves in so they don't blame Lori for having to clean up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good insight. See, I would never have known, right? I mm-hmm. I had no idea. Oh, girl, we didn't know either. We did everything wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think we did too. And we read all the books that told us how to do everything wrong. <laughs> so then we decided, you know, once we started this whole nacho thing, it was, we're going to do the complete opposite of what we read. And that's what worked. That is yeah. what worked. I had to step back. I had to focus on my relationship with David and my relationship with my son and stop trying to make him realize his kids were not perfect angels. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, that was the insight that I got from, from 
nacho kids, like from even reading on like the, even the FAQ, I'm like, yes, when you step back, like, it seems so simple now, but it's like, yeah, my partner can't see everything that's going on because I'm doing it all. And I'm so deep in it. Right. I'm not giving my partner space to parent and observe and do all those things. I'm taking it on because whatever my OCD, my planner, right project manager self, my all these things of people pleasing or whatever it is that's causing me to go into this way too deep. I'm not giving my my partner space. So yeah, stepping back and being like, hmm, you're not gonna go. I mean, I I I started doing this like really properly in like the last 10 days. And I'm just like, I'm okay with you guys not making your appointments and you guys not going to your kid activities and you guys not having lunch ready in the morning. And I'm okay with all of it because it's not, not my problem, right? Like I'm going to go do Pilates (laughs) and Mm -hmm. if the kids get there on time, good for them. If they don't, well, this is how you learn. Yes, exactly. And it's easier for you to say that being a step parent. Yes. Yes. That's the luxury of being a step. Yes. Oh, I need to, I need to remember that there is actually a really good side to this. So yes, Mm -hmm. you have kids around, but they are not your responsibility. You don't have to shape them. Right. right? You can be the bonus mom and you can make their lives better, but it is not my job. Yes, exactly. And how the kids turn out is not a reflection on you. Yes. Yes. Yep. Your job is to support your significant other in his role as a parent. And if he comes to you and says, hey, Mel, little Susie needs to go to gym this Friday at six and I won't be home till 630. Can you take her? If you don't Mm -hmm. mind, then you say yes. But if little Susie is a complete hellion and tells you she (laughs) hates you every single day and spits (laughs) at you in the car, then you have every right to say no, I think it would be best if you found somebody else to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not going to add value to my day on that day. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, well, I feel like, I don't know why that takes so much time to realize. I guess you just get into deep with what you think your role should be. And Yes. Well, we come in wanting to fix everything. Yes. And then before you know it, we are resentful stressed out, hateful step witches. <laughs> <laughs> step witches. Yeah, that's so true. That's what I was turning into. Yes. And then you're miserable with yourself. Then you're mad at them because you're miserable with yourself. And you forget that you came in doing all this. Yeah. Yes. That's the thing is I did it. Yes. Like I take full ownership. Nobody put nobody pushed me into the role I created for myself. I fully made that perfect stepmom roll up in my head and operated accordingly. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I remember sitting in the parking lot after we had left that meeting with the counselor that kept telling me they are not your kids. And of course, when he first told me that it kind of hurt my feelings because I did care about them, mm-hmm. but I knew they weren't my kids. I mean, come on, it's reality. Yeah. I'm sitting in the car and I'm like, they're not my kids. I am creating my own misery. Yes. And it was like, bam, there we go. Why Why am I doing this? And it's not that David didn't care if they brushed their teeth. Of course, he wanted them to brush their teeth. But I was just Johnny on the spot. Come 802, you needed to brush your teeth so you could be in bed by 830. Oh, my gosh. Yes. This is your, I would think that you're just basically talking about my life. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And 831, no, it's way past your bedtime. <laughs> yeah. Do you not know what your bedtime is? And then yeah. you're looking at your significant other saying, you know their bedtime's 830. Why aren't you doing something? Yes. Yeah. You're micromanaging kids and your partner. And it yes. is that's, a, that's an unhealthy place to be. Yes. And a lot of times what happens is the partner doesn't care if the kids go to bed at 830. You're the one that cares. Yes. So they're not enforcing that quote, quote, rule. And you're mad at them because they're not enforcing the rule. And they're like, well, you agreed to this. Well, they only agreed with you that they should be in bed at 830 because they got tired of hearing you complain about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're right. Micromanaging. That is exactly what stepmoms come in and try to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's easy to get sucked into it, but I am I'm enjoying this new journey of just stepping back and and figuring out how to be okay with things not going the way. Maybe it's it, it's because I don't have kids, and I'm like this is how I would operate if I had kids. I, I would definitely be a helicopter mom. I was raised by one, mm-hmm. um, so and that's just not my partner, right? That's yes. not his parenting style. So why am I trying to be a helicopter stepmom, right? Like that's not a role. But you know what's funny? If y'all did have a kid together, you would see a different parenting side of him more than likely. Hmm, interesting. Because most of the time, the bio parent isn't parenting the way they normally would in a nuclear family. And a lot of it is guilty parent syndrome. Mm. They don't want little Johnny to come to their house and have a bunch of chores when he doesn't have to do stuff at his mom's house because then he won't want to come here. True. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. I never really thought about that. Yep. And you not having kids. You think this is how you would parent kids or how you would be as a parent, you would be surprised. And I say that because, for instance, David's kids, when they were 13 or 14, David would fix their breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they are teenagers. My God, (laughs) fixing their breakfast. What's wrong with you? When my baby turned that age, I'm like, hey, darling, what you want for breakfast? (laughs) Yeah, so I guess you, you don't know until you live it. You don't. And a lot of mine is guilty parent syndrome, but it's not just because I'm afraid he's going to want to go live with his dad. It's because I don't want him raised the way I was. Mm, Interesting. I want him to feel loved and know that no matter what, that I love him and he can always come to me where my mom, I mean, granted, she had three kids, all girls, and we're five years apart. I know now why she was crazy. (laughs) Yeah. But we grew up in a time where it was normal for your parents to, I don't want to say beat you, but punishment was spankings or whoopings with a belt. I mean, you can't do that nowadays. And there were higher expectations. We did not question or did not even think about not doing our chores because the wrath of Gail would come home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's things are a little bit more relaxed now. Yes. And it was funny because as a child, I'm thinking, my mom is so mean and whatever. And then as an adult, I'm like, she was stressed to the max. My daddy didn't help her do crap. She had three of us, one of them being me, the rebel child, <laughs> one of them being the spoiled brat little sister, and one of them, the crazy older sister that she taught me what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> and she worked full time. Oh, gosh. What a trooper. Yeah. So no wonder. I mean, you appreciate your parents a whole lot more the older you get. Yes. Yeah. And you realize they're, they're, they were doing the best with what they had, right? Mm-hmm. I, yes. I've i had access to much more counseling and resources than my you know Turkish parents in the Middle East did, right? It, it right. was a different time and they didn't have access to that type of stuff, right? So- they were operating with a very limited tool set right. than I have. So I can't compare like, oh, well, you did, they did this and they screwed me up. And no, it's it's not the same. We're not in the same playing field. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can go to a weekly counseling session and then go to like a stepmom forum and I can go to, you know, whatever it is. And yeah, it's not the same. Well, and you think about it again, I know there's a pretty big age gap between me and you, I'm closer to your husband or your boyfriend's age. Yeah. But you think about it. And when we were growing up, when we were your age, the people that went to counseling, oh, something's wrong with you. Yeah. It wasn't normal. It was, you've got issues. They go to therapy. Yeah. Like you are so bad that you have to. Yeah. Like you are close to the mental facility. Mm Mm-hmm. You're getting ready to end up on Bull Street in Columbia, where the crazy (laughs) people are. It just wasn't looked at the same. And it's sad because you can't help but wonder how much better our generation would have been to not have that stigma placed on therapy or counseling and things like that. Yeah, it 
it is like now we're we're in a place where mental health is discussed more openly and that stigma of seeking help is you know depending on the type of help is is less but certainly not you know x amount of years ago when you were more hush hush about getting help yes yeah you didn't go to school and go oh yeah i had a therapy appointment today mhm and now it's just almost normal yeah yeah mhm yeah and that's the other thing is a lot of stepmoms, especially that I see in my Facebook group, they expect these kids to know how to handle situations better than they're handling them. Yeah. It's like, hang on. We've got to give grace to the kids. But I get it because I was so consumed with the hurt that I was experiencing and I felt like everybody was against me. I couldn't see anybody else's hurt or pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I can relate to that. Yeah. So what is one piece of advice that you would give someone that is child-free? What would you tell a stepmom or someone that meets a guy that's got kids that doesn't want kids? What piece of advice would you give them? And run cannot be your answer. (laughs) Yeah, there's some days that I would have said that. I I would say don't take the decision lightly. It's a big decision, even if it doesn't feel like it in the beginning. Oh, they're not my kids. And, you know, this, you know, I love him so much or I love her so much. It's not going to change anything. You are still a big part of those kids upbringing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready, be mindful that you can step away. Right. I think it, it would be smart to talk it through with a friend, with a counselor, with a a family member and see what, what do you want your life to look like in five, 10, you know, even one year, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's going to look significantly different. Yes. If you move forward with somebody who has a child or children. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, there are certain things that are deal breakers, like if, if you do have OCD at a level where you cannot have something you can't operate with clutter around you and it's going to really negatively impact your mental health and you are not really in a place where you want to deal with that, then this probably isn't the relationship for you, right? Like your home life is going to be different. Everything's going to be different. So map out and talk through where you see your life and the type of life you're living and and try to figure out if that relationship and that new dynamic is going to fit into what you have in mind. And if it doesn't, are you flexible? Right. What your life looks like. Because if you're not flexible, because whatever you think you're getting into is probably not it. (laughs) Right. I don't know if that's a really good piece of advice, but. No, that is a really good piece of advice. But I will add, if you know that you have OCD and your house has to be spotless, and you tremendously love your significant other, and you're willing to be flexible, go to counseling, go to therapy, get help with that Mm -hmm. before you move in. Because once you move in and you're in the jungle, we'll say, yeah, it's harder to deal with. Yeah. Or if you can afford it, explore the option of having two separate places. A lot of people are doing that. There's actually a lady that I'm going to have as a guest on the podcast. I can't remember when, but she she works with people about living apart together. That's what it's called. LAT. I guess that's what oh. they refer to it as. And we've actually had some couples do that. But I will say, from what we have seen and experienced with it, the couples, they never address the issues because they don't have to. Mm, they have blinders on. Right. But there's no need to talk about the issues they had with the cleaning and the stuff like that. But guess what? When the kids move out, they might move back in together and things would be great until grandkids come. Oh, I see. And then you're going to have those same challenges that you never did anything with. That's plus, like you said, it's costly. <laughs> it is so expensive. Yes, it is so expensive. To so upkeep the cheaper houses. option is therapy. Do some oh, counseling yeah. and and figure out what it is you want and 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 what you're willing to I hate to use the word sacrifice but you are going to sacrifice some things mm-hmm. right we um, all sacrifice mhm 
Yep. So knowing that ahead of time, or at least prepping yourself ahead of time is better than diving into it and being like, oh, this is great. Oh my God, this is not great. What did I do? Okay. It's not so bad. That roller coaster is jarring. Yes, it is. (laughs) Well, Mel, thank you so much for being a guest. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for having me. This is an awesome way to start the day. Well, come back in a couple of years and let us know how things are going. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it's a positive one. (laughs) It will be. Got to think positive for it to be positive. (laughs) Thanks so much, Lori. Thanks. So as y'all heard, Mel does tell her stepkids to clean up. Mm -hmm. It has worked well for her. It no worky for Lori. (laughs) You can't even get your own son to clean up. Again, it no worky for Lori. (laughs) I can't get my own husband to clean up. I can't get a dog to clean up. I can't get you to clean up. Oh. Don't get don't even get me We're started. We're sorry. The number you have reached is no longer in service. <laughs> don't get me started. Please hang up and don't call back again. <laughs> and don't call back again. Yep. She said there needs to be an app reminding kids of things to do. They would just cut it off. Yeah. You know, I've tried those reminder apps and it's not it's almost like the alarm clock when you're trying to get up in the morning, you just keep turning it off. <laughs> I snooze them a lot. Yeah. Anyway, one thing that she says that I really, really liked is that stepmoms can tend to micromanage the stepkids and their partner. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true, true, true. Some people like being micromanaged. Some people don't. Some do. Not this girl. Mm -hmm. You don't even want to be managed, micromanaged, macromanaged. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh. I can manage myself. Yeah, we see how that works out. My gosh. <laughs> I didn't say that was bad. I just said we see how that works out. You immediately go to, <laughs> to it being a bad oh, thing. Oh, I'm having chest pains. <laughs> coming, Elizabeth. I'm coming. <laughs> you wonder why I always go to the bad. Why? Do you, <laughs> you don't always go to the bad. I do most of the time. It's because I live with you. That's not true. You always say bad things, David. You don't live with me. <laughs> you put up with me. <laughs> I tolerate my husband. I live with you. No. (laughs) We live with the dogs. (laughs) Yeah, they do run the house. It is their house. All right. So what do we have coming up? Um, Tomorrow. (gasps) Valentine's Day is coming up. Oh, gosh. When this comes out, if you have not gotten your significant other something for Valentine's Day, you better run to the store now. Or? You're going to be lucky to find one of them $5 heart-shaped candy boxes that have two pieces of candy in it. Well, luckily, I got some left over from last year that you will be getting. And Really? And. I don't do expired. Well, they're not expired yet. Um, but I did see some some fresh flowers being put out at the cemetery Sunday. So you'll be getting a fresh bouquet of flowers. How crappy would that be for somebody <laughs> to go steal flowers that a loved one laid upon their last resting place to give them to their girlfriend slash wife for Valentine's Day? I don't know. We'll find out. That's like that dumb crook news. <laughs> is that what it is? Uh, Idiots among us. So another thing you could do is just turn your clocks back 24 hours, and then your significant other will think it's the 13th. And so you run to the store on the 15th when she thinks it's the 14th, and then you get everything half price. That might would work if your significant other works at home and they aren't around a bunch of other people getting roses that day. Well, I'm sure in some part of the world, you're ahead. <laughs> well, you know what, David? Men can get Valentine's Day presents, too. I don't want no flowers. Ain't nobody getting you no flowers, David. Good. Don't you worry. I want something that blows up. I would die if somebody sent you flowers for Valentine's Day. I would, too, because I'd be like, who is this chick? I shouldn't have said that, because you'll probably have somebody send them. Yeah. You said you would die. She's 23 (laughs) years younger. Send them on, baby. David Sims. (laughs) Since you weren't a part of this interview, David, and you probably won't listen to it for a while, I'll tell you (laughs) that that was probably one of the reasons that Bio Mom wasn't real, you know, lovey-dovey toward the stepmom. Oh, you think? Just the jealousy? Nobody said jealousy. Has to do with age. She's half her age. But maybe she went to school with her kids. Okay, folks, <laughs> the struggle is real. <laughs> the struggle is real. Yeah, it is. I struggle every day. Okay, David, wrap it up. 
I'm done. I'm done. We're, we're done. We're done. done. Stick it forward. D-O-N-E, done. <laughs> okay, folks, join us next week when Lori says... I'm about sick and tired of you, David Sims. <laughs> That'd be tomorrow. You got to wear it next week. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.